Let's set the scene. Your brain is sending a bunch of electrical signals to your body and is receiving stimuli in response as you watch this video. Here's where the fundamental problem starts. Are those electrical signals really identical to your consciousness? Oh sure, they're correlated, but are they the same thing? The problem is that if they were the same thing, why is it that we can't do neuroscience by pure introspection? Why is it that if my thoughts were really just electrical impulses in my brain, I can't know anything about those electrical impulses or those neurons involved through introspection? Atheist Sam Harris puts it like this. There's nothing about introspection that leads you to sense that your subjectivity is at all dependent or even related to voltage changes and chemical interactions going on inside your head. Okay, you can, you can feel, you can drop acid, you can meditate for a year, you can do whatever you want to perturb your nervous system. You can, you can feel yourself to be one with the universe, and at no point in that transformation do you get a glimpse that there's a hundred trillion neurons in your head, uh, or synapses in your head, that, that are doing anything. Atheist philosopher Thomas Nagel says, If a mental event is really a physical event and nothing else, then a mental event, once its properties are sufficiently understood, should be sufficient for the taste of sugar, the feeling of pain, whatever it is supposed to be identical with. But it doesn't seem to be. It seems conceivable, for any physical event, there should be a physical event without any experience at all. Experience of taste seems to be something extra, contingently related to the brain state. Something produced rather than constituted by the brain state. So it cannot be identical to the brain state in the same way water is identical to H2O. Let me give a few thought experiments to help set the scene. First, check out John Searle's Chinese Room. In essence, he argues that knowing syntax isn't quite the same thing as consciousness, because one can know syntax without being conscious of what that syntax means. Check out John Searle's Chinese Room, I'll link it in the comment description. I want to focus primarily on Mary the Color Scientist. Mary is a color scientist in the future who's locked in a black and white room her whole life and learns all the physical facts there are to know about color. She knows all the physical facts about how light goes through her eyes, how about, how, about how the brain receives these signals, about how her neurons react, etc. Now the question is, would she know what the color red looks like without having any first person subjective experience of red? From this, we can distinguish between mental properties and physical properties because it's quite clear that she wouldn't know what red looks like. Without any subjective apprehension of red, even though she knows all the physical pop properties about red, she wouldn't know what red looks like, which means red is a form of qualia. From first, it's important to know that even physical descriptions of light are descriptions of knowledge, which are functions of consciousness. But that aside, the fact that her conscious experience is distinguished from the physical properties that supposedly comprise it means that her conscious experience is in fact something different. There's something true of her subjective apprehension of, of color that's not true of color's physical properties. Premise 1. Mary knows all the physical facts of the color red. Premise 2. Mary learns something new when she sees red. Conclusion. Some facts are not physical facts. If consciousness is identical to parts of the brain or process of the brain, then once the physical properties of the brain and how the brain perceives things are understood, that should be sufficient to completely understand the experience of consciousness. But as Mary the Color Scientist shows above, that doesn't seem to be the case. You can learn all the physical facts you want about color, and yet the subjective apprehension of a thing, i.e. qualia, is still something that's separate, something different. Here's a concrete argument that shows that mind is not identical to matter. Premise 1. Mind has the property that it could exist in a possible idealist world. An idealist world is a world in which mind is the only fundamental substance and matter is emergent from mind. And we can conceive of a possible world in which idealism is true, because it's possible that this world is an idealist world and there doesn't seem to be anything logically incoherent about that possibility. Premise 2. Matter does not share this property, because clearly matter cannot exist in a world in which mind is the only fundamental substance. So the conclusion logically follows, mind is not identical to matter, and therefore mind must be something different. Well, why else can't be the mind be a property or process of the brain? If the mind is a property of the brain, then we can define mind as M and property or process as P. If M equals P, 
then whatever is true of M should be true of P, whatever is possibly true of M should be possibly true of P, and in all possible worlds, M should always equal P by Leibniz's law. Premise 1. It's possible that solipsism is true. Solipsism is the view that your mind exists and everything else is a projection of it. There's nothing incoherent about that possibility, though it is highly unlikely. Premise 2. There is a possible world in which solipsism is true. That follows from premise 1. Premise 3. Possible worlds cannot contain just processes or properties, but must also contain entities. You can't have a world with tall in it without there being anything tall. You can't have the water cycle without water or evolution without anything evolving. Processes and properties must always exist alongside entities. Conclusion, there is something true of your mind, namely, it can exist in a possible world alone that's not true of a process or a property, because it can't exist in a possible world alone. Thus, by Leibniz's law, they are not the same thing. Premise 1. It is possible that this world is an idealist world. And again, idealism is the view that mind is the only fundamental substance that exists. Premise 2. There is a possible world in which idealism is true. That follows from premise 1. Premise 3. Possible worlds cannot contain just processes or properties, but must also contain entities. You can't have a world with tall without there being anything tall, etc. There is something true of your mind, namely it can exist in a possible idealist world alone, being the only fundamental substance, that's not true of a process or a property, since it cannot exist in a possible world alone, and it certainly cannot exist as a fundamental substance. Thus, by Leibniz's law, they are not the same thing. I will link the introspective argument in the annotations. I hope this video was helpful for you. God bless.